Twas battered and scarred, and the auctioneer thought it scarcely worth his while to waste much time in the old violin, but he held it up with a smile. What am I bid for this old violin? Who'll start the bidding for me? A dollar? A dollar. Who'll make it two? Two dollars. Who'll make it three? Three dollars once, three dollars twice, and going and going and... But no. From the room far back, a gray-haired man stepped forward and picked up the bow. And wiping the dust off the old violin and tightening its loosened strings, he played a melody pure and sweet as a caroling angel sings. The music stopped, and the auctioneer, in a voice that was quiet and low, said, Now what am I bid for this old violin? And he held it up with a bow. A thousand dollars. Who'll make it two? Two thousand. Who'll make it three? Three thousand once, three thousand twice, and going and going and gone, said he. The people cheered, but some of them cried, We do not quite understand. What changed its worth? Quick came the reply, The touch of the master's hand. And many a man with a life out of tune, all battered and scarred with sin, is auctioned cheap by a thoughtless crowd, much like the old violin. A mess of pottage, a glass of wine, a game, and he travels on. He's going once, he's going twice, he's going and almost gone when the master comes. And the foolish crowd never can quite understand the worth of a soul and the change that is wrought by the touch of the master's hand. That's a poem that was written in 1921 by Myra Brooks Welch. And it brings up two very important issues. The first one is, how much is a person worth? And the second is, when is it too late for a person to be redeemed? Let me bring those questions to you a little bit more personally. Let me ask you, first of all, how much are you worth? I don't mean that in any financial terms, such as how much is your net worth, but how much are you worth to the people who love you? How much are you worth to God who created you? Now, how much is someone you love worth? Maybe a parent, a child, a spouse, relative, or friend. Again, not in a financial sense. But how much are, is that person worth to you? And how much is that person worth to God who created them? And third, how much are those you don't like worth? Maybe somebody who's hurt you. A group whose lifestyle or politics you find offensive. And that is clearly the case in our day today. There's a lot of people with politics that we find offensive in one way or the other. Maybe that person's not worth a lot to you, but how much is that person worth to someone who loves them? And everybody is loved by someone. And how much is that person worth to God who created them? Especially if they, what is offensive in them were to change. The answer to those questions is important for understanding my faith journey, which is what I'm going to share about this morning, why I wrote my book, and why I'm convinced that God will ultimately restore all of his creation to the perfection that he initially intended. My journey actually began before I was born. My mom had a problem. It was my dad. No, it wasn't that kind of problem. Actually, they had a very good marriage. But my father, according to the doctor, couldn't have children. Well, my parents grew up in an immigrant family, and to them, children were very, very important. My mom had had a couple of miscarriages, and some of the people in the extended immigrant family felt that it was really incumbent upon them to inform my mother that she was cursed by God. And that brought deep anguish to my mom. And she would cry periodically, and on one occasion, she was talking with a friend of hers, who was a Roman Catholic woman, and the Roman Catholic friend said, why don't you go down to the church and take out a novena? Novena means nine. So my mom went down to the church, this Catholic church, 
for nine weeks and she prayed and asked God to give her a child. After she conceived, she went back for nine more weeks to thank God for enabling her to get pregnant and prayed that God would keep that child till the end of the term. Then after I was born, she went back for nine more weeks to thank God for giving her a healthy baby boy. Eighteen months later, my brother was born. Now I share that for a couple of reasons. Number one, I'm convinced that God wanted me to be born. I'm also convinced that God wanted my brother to be born. And I'm convinced that God wanted you and every other person who has ever walked in the face of this earth to be born. Now, you live in Colorado. In Pennsylvania, during this last primary election, there was a woman named Kathy Barnett. Kathy Barnett was running for U.S. Senator from the state of uh, Pennsylvania. Most people didn't know about it until she started running and she shared her story. She was actually born from a, a mother who had been raped. The mother was 11 years old when she was raped, and the man who did it was 21 years old. And Kathy Barnett said, I had nothing to do with how I was conceived, but I was important back then, and I'm important now. God wanted Kathy Barnett to be born. There were two important lessons I learned from my parents as, we grew up, grew, uh, as I was growing up. One was that my brother and I were loved no matter what. My dad used to ask me periodically and my brother, how much do I love you? And we'd say, how much? And he'd say, all the way up to the sky and back again, and then he'd make up a big number. 500 billion, 675 million, 335,673 times and more. Wow, that was amazing. We didn't know how far the sky was. We didn't know how big that number was, but we just knew that our Father loved us more than the biggest number and the greatest distance that we could even imagine. My Father loved me, and my mom loved me, and, he loved, and they loved my brother as well. We also, I also learned that my parents didn't have favorites. They loved me, and they loved my brother. They would go out of their way for me and out of the, their way for my brother, and I knew that they would never reject me. I could do all kinds of bad things, and my father would discipline me, but he wouldn't give up on me. He wouldn't abandon me. He wouldn't abandon my brother either. I used to tease my mom. I said, you always did love Brian more than me. And she'd say, no, no, Georgie, don't say that. The only reason I could say that was because both she and I knew it was not true. She did not have favorites. Well, it may come as a shock to you, but not all Greeks are philosophers and own restaurants. But my family did. My dad was always ready to share his thoughts on life, politics, religion, even on things he never even had thought about before. He'd give you his opinion. I admired my dad, but I was not like that. Life to me was a jigsaw puzzle without a picture. All these pieces together, and I just didn't know how they fit together was God Santa Claus. Maybe he gave gifts to those who were nice and withheld them from those who were naughty. Was he a divine watchmaker who created the universe and then just kind of let it run on its own? Was he like Aladdin's genie, awesome power, in a tiny little living space <laughs> that was available to you if you rubbed the lamp in just the right way? I didn't really know. I had made a profession of faith when I was a boy, but I didn't really understand what it meant. Went to college, and I was drifting away from my faith that I had with a little, as a little boy. And I met a group of Christians who had a different quality of life than I did. And I can remember one night sitting up, talking with someone late into the night, asking why was it that I was a second-rate Christian? Well, I was invited to a prayer meeting by this group of Christians, and when I was there, a young man came up to me and asked if, he'd, if I'd like to just sit down and talk to him for a while and talk about some spiritual things. And I was going to say no, and all of a sudden my mouth said yes. So I went over and talked with him uh, the next night, and he shared a couple of things. He shared basically that there were three kinds of people. There was a natural man, 
didn't understand the things of the Spirit of God. There was a spiritual man, somebody who really walked with God and experienced God's power and um, had a, 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 a close relationship with God. And then there was what he called a carnal man or a worldly man, a person who had Christ in his life, but he had an up and down spiritual experience, he had no desire for Bible study or prayer, and he was just all confused. And boy, I looked at that, I thought, I'm the third one right there. And so he said, well, George, the problem with you is that you're trying to make yourself the boss and God's your servant. It's got to be the other way around. God is the boss and you're the servant. You experience significance, power for living when you fit into God's plan, not when you try to fit God into your plan. That changed my life. I was so excited. And I realized at that time as I began to grow a little bit more that God was great and that God was good. And just like my parents, he was not just interested in me, God loved everyone. And like my parents, God did not have favorites. Well, I graduated from college, went to work for a radio station for about nine months, got married, and then through a series of interesting circumstances, which I won't share, God led my wife and I to go to Campus Crusade for Christ in California to be a part of uh, their ministry in the radio, TV, film ministry. Went out there, and I, I learned a lot of lessons. Crusade, Crusade was a wonderful place to grow, especially as a young couple. There were a lot of other young people that had a great uh, desire to serve God and were growing in their faith. And so I learned a lot of lessons, but one very important lesson. One night, I, or one morning, I was sitting down having devotions, and I remembered an event that occurred back in my high school days. When I was in high school, I, uh, I went out for wrestling in my senior year. We had just started a wrestling program in my junior year. I didn't go out, but in my senior year. Well, what that meant was I was much less experienced than the other guys that I was going to be wrestling against. And I wasn't very good, and so I never made it in my own weight class. But there was a guy in the weight class above me who had a difficulty getting down to the proper weight, so he was disqualified, and they needed somebody to fill the slot, and it was me. So I go out on the mat, and I'm facing somebody who's bigger than I am, stronger than I am, more experienced than I am, and I knew I was going to lose. And so pretty soon, I'm down on the mat, and I'm fighting to be, prevent getting pinned. And the thought would come into my mind, George, why don't you just give up? You're going to lose anyway. And I'm ashamed to say it, but that's exactly what I did. I kind of said, oh, and I give up. And if I hadn't, I wouldn't have won the match, but I could have saved my team two points from a decision as opposed to a pin. Well, that morning in California, when I remembered that, it just came into my mind. I thought, oh, God, please, whatever you do, don't let me do that in life. Don't let me give up in life until I'm genuinely defeated. God made me tenacious. <laughs> I went to seminary, and even while I was in, uh, on Campus Crusade, I was beginning to grow in my relationship with God and realizing that God was, again, like my parents. He loved everyone, and he didn't give up on everyone. And uh, where did hell fit into this? It just didn't seem right. As I would read scripture, it just didn't seem like that was the kind of God that would send the majority of people that he had created to unending conscious suffering. But I'd never heard anything else. So anyway, when I'm in seminary, I began having these rumblings. And basically what they were saying, I didn't actually verbalize them this way, but what they were saying was, I was asking myself, was God a loser? Did an all-powerful, all-wise, all-loving God create a universe where the vast majority would end up consciously suffering unbearable pain forever? Was creation very good in the beginning, but in the end, almost very good or maybe very bad? Did Jesus fail in his mission to seek and save the lost? Would most of the lost never be found? Is sin more powerful than grace? So powerful that it could cause God, who is love, to actually forsake those he loved. Is darkness more powerful than light? On a level playing field, 
is evil really more powerful than good? I wrestled with those things. And finally, the last semester of the seminary, I decided, you know, I'm going to pick up on that lesson that I learned back in California. You don't give up till you're genuinely defeated. Even though everybody else has told me that hell is never ending conscious suffering, I'm going to use that as a topic of a research paper and find out there's got to be somebody in the history of the church that had thought differently. Well, I went to all the systematic theologies, I read a number of books, and everybody said the same thing. Hell is never ending suffering for the majority of people who ever lived. And then I suddenly came across a book, History of Opinions on the Scriptural Doctrine of Retribution by a man named Edward Beecher. He was the brother of Harriet Beecher Stowe. And he pointed out what the early church believed, as well as talked about a couple of other specific scriptural things. And the basic message of what he was saying was that in the early church, there was a large number of people who were leaders who believed that hell was real, but it had a positive purpose and it didn't last forever. At the end of time, all those God created will ultimately be in heaven. Wow! That was exciting. I had never heard that before. You know, it's interesting. We're evangelicals. I assume that's what you consider yourself. That's what I consider myself, an evangelical. Evangelicals are wonderful because they look at the scriptures and they believe that God's word is true. And I believe it's inerrant. I believe that it's true. And that what the apostles said was right. And then we jump from the apostles 1,500 years till we get to the reformers. And we read what John Calvin and Martin Luther and... Uh, uh, Zwingli, I can't remember his first name. Yeah, Urich Zwingli wrote. And we forget that there was 1,500 years of really godly people that were writing in that mid-interim. And so what this man was doing was bringing up what some of those people were saying in the earlier centuries. I'm, so for me it was exciting because I wanted to read what the early church had to say. I'm very much aware that people can and do take Scripture out of context to prove almost anything. Uh, a friend recently said, if something is new, it's probably not true. If it's true, it's probably not new. But now here was a belief by the leaders and the laity in the early church that, first of all, they were closest to Jesus and the apostles. They read the New Testament in their native tongue. They grew faster and had a greater impact on the surrounding culture than any other group of Christians in history. They established the faith that we now profess. They wrote the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed to explain clearly what true Christians believed. They formulated the doctrines of the Trinity and the deity of Christ. And they actually assembled the 27 books that we call the New Testament. So why wouldn't I want to hear what they had to say? Well, as I began to study that further and further, I realized that they believed God was not a loser. A man named Origen wrote, For nothing is impossible to the omnipotent, nor is anything incapable of restoration to, the, to its creator. Creation will be very good in the end. Gregory of Nyssa wrote, No single being created by God will fail to achieve the kingdom of God. Jesus Christ is not a failure. For he is Savior, not of some and of others not. For all things are arranged with a view to the salvation of the universe by the Lord of the universe. A man named Clement of Alexandria wrote that. Sin is not more powerful than grace. The punishments to be inflicted for heinous and manifold sins, Theodorus of Tarsus said, are far more surpassed by the magnitude of mercy. Darkness is not more powerful than light. The wicked who have committed evil the whole period of their lives shall be punished till they learn that by continuing in sin, they only continue in misery. That's why sin can't really last all that long, because people suddenly realize, I'm just miserable. Why do alcoholics stop being alcoholics and turn to Christ, sometimes in their 20s, sometimes 30s, sometimes 50s, sometimes 70s. Why? Because they realize that by following along and where they've been going, they have destroyed everything. Their health is gone, their marriages are messed up, their families are destroyed. They realize that sin leads to misery. 
And then evil is not more powerful than good. Gregory of Nyssa said, in due course, evil will pass over into non-existence. It will disappear utterly from the realm of existence. I wrote my paper. I got an A-. minus. Nobody agreed on it. It was a controversial subject. I went up to some of the professors and I passed along my paper because I was excited. I had discovered something that nobody knew about. And they said, well, good job, George. You know, you're a student, but you don't realize that in the subsequent centuries, you know, from the reformers on and even before that, the church realized that those early Christians were wrong. So I decided I would keep that as a private hope. And I did that for many years. And I'd share my thoughts with people periodically, but, you know, I'd better be kind of careful. I, I actually became an elder of a church, and I told the, the pastor what I believe, gave him a copy of my paper, and he said, well, just don't talk about it. And so I said, okay. Well, I decided, when I was a, a boy, a little boy, people would come up to me and say, what do you want to be when you grow up? And my answer was always, an actor or a missionary. And God actually made me both. <laughs> I do commercials, uh, have done commercials, industrial films, trade show spokesman in Boston and New York. I was a spokesman for the ABC affiliate in Boston for three and a half years. I was on the board of directors for Screen Actors Guild in Boston for six years. I developed a one-man show that uh, I've actually performed a couple of the stories here uh, straight from the Bible. I can, was a consultant with the Bowery Mission in New York for six years. I worked with a ministry to media professionals in New York City for 10 years, narrated the NIV Bible, and right now, if you listen to uh, radio or television, you can hear my voice as the voice of Puffs Tissues. And those in need, it deserves Puffs indeed. That's me. But what happened was, is I got involved in this work because my focus was I wanted to get, I felt that there's a need for godly individuals to get into positions of influence within secular institutions. And so I was going to go into the media and share my faith and talk with people. And what Ultimate Restoration did for me was it made me free to be able to talk to anybody. I could genuinely love all kinds of people without a hidden agenda. I didn't have this agenda that I've got to get them to a point where I can you know, take out the four spiritual laws and ask them to pray to receive Christ. No, I could love them. And as a result of that, I could focus on building relationships, not just winning arguments. If you build relationships with people, the opportunities naturally come along to share about all kinds of things. People will, if you've got a relationship with them, they'll talk to you about their marriages. They'll talk to you about their children. They'll talk to you about all kinds of things, health issues. And you can bring your faith aspect of things into the conversation. I remember one man named Tom. He was a gay man in Boston when it wasn't cool to be gay. And uh, one day he suggested that I uh, be a spokesman for this one company. And uh, for a kind of a technical reason, actually for me it was a spiritual reason, I turned it down. I had no money at the time. I had just graduated from seminary. I was broke. And uh, this would have been a wonderful opportunity, but I thought, no, I can't do that. So I turned it down. Tom called me up on the phone. He said, George, tell me again why you won't take this job. I explained it to him. He said, wow, I knew your faith was strong, but I didn't think it was that strong. There was another man, Jeff. Jeff was, I'm on the conservative side. He was on the liberal side. He was on the way liberal side. Anyway, he was writing a book on spiritual things. I was writing a book on spiritual things. So we would talk with one another a lot about God, about life, about various different things. And uh, one day I met him in the subway and uh, he was all upset because of some things happening. He said, all these people, all they're interested in is money. They just want money, money, money. They don't care about people. They just want money. I looked at him and I said, Jeff, what percentage of your income do you give away? <laughs> he looked at me kind of dumbfounded. He said, well, I don't know, maybe a one or two percent. I said, well, then you're a hypocrite. Because here you are telling me about how much you want to help people, and all you do is spend your money on yourself. You make a lot more than I do, but I give away a much larger percentage of my income than you do of, your, of uh, yours. You're just a hypocrite. Well, you got me there. <laughs> That's exactly how he said it, too. I met him a few months later in the in the subway again. Actually, the first time I was on the train. This time I was on the subway. And I went up to him and I said, hey, uh, Jeff, did you ever pray that prayer? Oh, I'm sorry. 
when I was on the train, asking, telling me that he was a hypocrite, I said, you know, Jeff, have you ever actually asked God if he was real? No, I can't say I ever have. Well, let me encourage you to do that, but don't do it unless you're serious. Because if God is real, and if he reveals himself to you, it will probably be because he wants something to change in your lifestyle. So don't do it unless you're serious. Well, okay. Well, then I met him in the subway. I said, by the way, Jeff, did you ever pray that prayer? He said, well, me and him, we had a conversation. That was his words. Me and him, we had a conversation. Didn't see him for about four months late until uh, four or five months later, the night before he died. Found out that he had been diagnosed with a brain tumor, and I just found out about it, and uh, that he was not expected to live. And uh, so I knew where he lived, and I figured, okay, he could be in this hospital. So I called the hospital and said, is Jeff so-and-so there? Yeah, he is. Can he have visitors? Yeah, yeah, you can come and visit him. And so I went down, and... Uh, walked up to the nurse's station, and I asked again, is it okay for me to go in and uh, see Jeff? Yeah, you can go in. And as I'm down on my way to the room, I prayed and I said, oh God, please don't have anybody else in the room, because I'm sure that if I go in there, they'll kick me out. I walked in, he was all alone, couldn't talk. But I, I looked at him, I said, Jeff, do you know who I am? He nodded his head, yes. Do you want me to leave? He shook his head, no. I talked to him a little bit about what we had talked about over the years, about that prayer that uh, he had prayed. And uh, I prayed for him and asked God to come in and, and touch his body and his, his, his spirit. Finished the praying, his wife came in and kicked me out. <laughs> it was interesting, at his memorial service, several people mentioned that, you know, I think he must have known he was going to die because he was just different for the last few months. I'm convinced it was because he had entered into a personal relationship with God. Whether that was true or not, I don't know, because I was not able to find out. But I was able to talk to Jeff, and I was able to talk to Tom, and I was able to talk to so many other people because I could love them without having a hidden agenda. And I could get focused on building relationships, not just winning arguments. Well, 29 years after I wrote my paper, I decided that I needed to rewrite it because it was a research paper. And so uh, I got, and I thought, yeah, I want to give it out to some people that might be helpful. So I started doing some more research, and what turned out to be not just a rewritten paper, it turned out to be a book, and that's the book that I wrote. Um, there have been a number of neg negative consequences to that. I ended up, um, well, I'll tell you that in a second. Uh, I sent a copy to the man that was in charge of the media ministry I worked for. He wrote back that he was devastated when he read a manuscript, hadn't even published it yet, but just the manuscript, and three days later, I was terminated for doctoral aberrations. A friend at church for 20 years, where my wife and I and our family have been active for 20 years, uh, got all upset, went to the elders, told them what I was believing, and then I was informed that I could not continue to be a, a member of the church. Uh, a Bible study that my wife and I were attending uh, an adult Bible study, they asked us not to come back. We were involved in a ministry to international students, and the people said, no, you can't do that any longer. I had a friend, longtime friend. We would talk for hours about things, spiritual things. When he found out what I believed, he didn't want to be my friend anymore. And then I could no longer perform at a lot of the conferences, churches, conventions that I had been involved with before. So there were definitely negative consequences involved in that. But I kept on thinking now, okay, I've been uh, I wrote my book, I sent it out to 28 different publishers who said no. And I'm thinking, man, I'm never going to get this thing published. Here, I, I can't continue on with uh, my church and friendships, and, and I haven't even published a book yet. It's just manuscript that people heard about that I believe this. But then I thought, you know, I remembered back to when I was in crusade and that lesson, don't give up until you're genuinely defeated. I thought, well, you know, there is an option. It's self-publishing, which was never out there before through Amazon, that kind of thing. So I thought, I'm just going to do that. And God was gracious. He led me to a, uh, actually my former roommate in college, who I hadn't seen for 42 years, uh, called me up one time, and uh, he was an editor. 
and uh, a marketing guy, and he was a journalism major in, co in uh, college, and he helped me kind of edit my book a little bit. And so finally in 2017, I published Heaven's Doors, 39 years after writing my paper, 10 years after starting the book, and uh, it actually was awarded a silver medal in theology in the Illumination Book Awards for exemplary Christian literature. I was very excited of what God had done. So quickly, what have I learned from my journey? That's kind of my journey on how I got there. What have I learned? Number one, God's love is unconditional. God wants to save all mankind. And that's very clear from Scripture. This is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he's patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Secondly, God's power is irresistible. He is able to save all mankind. Not only does he want to, he's able to save all mankind. There is no wisdom, no insight, no plan that can succeed against the Lord. The Lord does whatever he pleases in the heavens and on the earth, in the seas and in all their depths. I know that you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted, Job said. And the angel said to Mary, nothing is impossible with God. And then thirdly, God never gives up. He will save all mankind. At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And every use in the New Testament of that word translated confess in the passage connotes voluntary confession to freely, openly, wholeheartedly acknowledge or give praise. God doesn't force praise from vanquished enemies, and he doesn't accept hypocritical or feigned praise. At the end of the book of Revelation, the gates of the city are always open when you have the New Jerusalem. The fruit of the tree of life is always available. Its leaves are for the healing of the nations. At that time, there will, be no, there will no longer be any curse. And then the word is given to those outside the gates. The spirit and the bride say, come. The spirit is God's spirit. The bride is the believers already in the New Jerusalem. So who are they talking to? Those outside who are in the lake of fire, that's a purifying lake, not a destructive lake. God is good. He's not partial, favoring some over others. He does not change, acting graciously toward sinners, sinners while they're alive on earth, but then withdrawing his hand of mercy after death. He's not cruel, able to save all, but choosing rather to consign most of the human race to endless conscious suffering. And he's not weak, desiring to save all, but ultimately powerless to do so. So how valuable are you and everyone else who has ever lived? When my kids were small, I used to ask them a question. Like my dad asked my brother and I a question. I asked my kids a question. How much are you worth? The answer was always the same. I'm priceless. That's not just how important my children are. That's how important you are and everybody that you know and everybody you don't know. You and they are priceless. Let's pray. Our God and Father, we do thank you that you are not a weak God you are not a cruel God. You are a God who loves those you created. You're a God who's able to save all, and you never give up. Lord God, thank you for giving us the privilege of knowing you and of knowing that message. Please guide us from this day. Thank you for the privilege of being a part of your family. In Jesus' name, amen.